Well, Father, you are our king and you are the anchor of our soul. And we just come before you this evening very humbly. We thank you for who you are, what you are. We thank you that you will forever walk with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father God, that you are, first of all, a God of love. A God that loves us no matter where we're at. A God that understands us no matter where we're at. And Father God, you called us to have a foundation of love. And we ask tonight, Father God, that you cement us in that foundation. We thank you, Father God, that no storm can ever take us off course because you hold us securely in your hands. And Father, we just thank you that you're here tonight. You're here to bless us, to teach us, to revive us once again of your ways. I thank you, Father God, that the work that you be in and your children you are going to complete. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here in all your essence. I thank the angelic hosts that are here ministering to God's people tonight. Father God, we are full of thanks because you are you. And Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You know, <clears throat> I will never understand how you can uh, live with a person and hate them. No matter what they've done to you, we're supposed to be children of love. And it's not your hate being thrown back at them that's going to save them. It's the love of Christ. The pure love of Christ. We are watching the world destroy themselves, are we not? One pitted against the other. Professing to know Christ, or not professing to know Christ, but so much hate being thrown around. God's trying to get his church to be a church of love. To bear the cross as Jesus did. And no matter what you have to go through, just go through it. We sing so many wonderful songs about Jesus, but we really don't understand the depth of the songs that we sing. We just sing them from lips that have not been purged yet from wickedness. We, you know, our lips have not yet been purged from hate and discord. God's trying to change us from the inside out. Just let him change you tonight. Let him take you to that new place in him that he so desires to take you. Thank you, Father. Well, I'm going to start out tonight with a little joke. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out how to do this after the moving of the Spirit. But we're going to go with it, all right? Did you hear about the 85-year-old woman who went out on a blind date with a 92-year-old man? She came home very frustrated. Her daughter said, Mom, what is wrong? She said, I had to slap him three times. Her daughter was shocked. She said, Mom, you mean he tried to get fresh? Her mom said, No, I thought he was dead. <laughs> and then I wonder if sometimes the Lord needs to give us a slap because we look like we are dead. And when I'm up here preaching, I like to walk around and slap some of you because you look like you're dead and so uninterested in what God is trying to do in your life. Amen. Lamentations 3.22. Oh, we're going to talk about God's mercy endures forever. And this stems from the, the word he gave me to put out this week. And then after he gave me the word, then he started speaking to me. So I just, we're going to have a teaching on this. 
Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. <clears throat> great is your faithfulness. God's loyal love could have run out, could not have run out. His merciful love could not have dried up. They are created new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. God says, I'll love you even in the, to the right, very depths of hell. Jesus walks the corridors of hell and he weeps over those who should not be there, but they chose that destination. The fact that this statement appears in the book of Lamentation is one of the most remarkable things in the Bible. Jeremiah had just witnessed the wrath of God poured out in undiluted concentration upon his nation. If you don't think that God isn't angry with our nation, and he, he's doing what he's doing so he can get us to our attention, and so we can become the nation that he so desires us to be. All right, this is what happened in Jeremiah's day. Their armies had been defeated, their defenses overwhelmed, their riches pillaged, all their cities were looted and burned, their men killed, their women and children taken captive and enslaved. Most of those who remained alive had suffered mass resettlement with forced marches for one thousandths of miles to a foreign country where they were settled among people who hated them. God took those people, forced them to march thousands of miles, and settled them in a place where people hated them. But here Jeremiah, still in the midst of weeping over the national calamity, begins to praise God that his mercies are new every morning. It doesn't matter how mad God, at, how mad God was at you last night. His mercies are new in the morning. All right. Are you experiencing tough times? Have you ever felt like there would be no tomorrow or that life is as bad as it can get? There are too many bills to pay and not enough money. You may have sicknesses and diseases that you can't get healed from. And life is just too weary to go on another day. We know that goes on every day. God's word sends a note of encouragement to look up and find hope. No matter how bad it may seem, God is still on the throne. And we can find comfort and hope in that fact. No matter how bad it may seem, God is still on the throne and we can find comfort and hope in that fact. We need fresh proofs of God's love. Every morning when the sun comes up, God wants us to have fresh proofs of his unchanging love and compassion. Yeah, I'm going to tell this, this little testimony that I have that, you know, one time when I was very first saved, I thought I had sinned. I hadn't, but, you know, I thought I had. And I didn't talk to God for three days. But one morning I got up and I looked out the window and I saw God. I was going to say, how beautiful your trees are. And God started laughing. He said, I've been waiting three days to talk to you. His mercy was there all that time. But I thought he couldn't love me. And I really didn't do anything bad. But in my eyes, I thought it was terrible. And if I knew, could remember what it was, I'd tell you. But there God was. He was just, he said, I've been waiting. I want to share something with you. So for three days, I suffered. And I didn't have to suffer because my father was just waiting to talk to me. Don't let the devil make you believe that God won't talk to you if you mess up. Because he will. He's just waiting. And I'm saying he cher I hear him saying he cherishes you with an everlasting love. A love that never fades. It's not human love. It's a deep, deep love. We wake up to a new beginning. Yesterday's troubles and the dark night are over. God promises that whatever needs we have for the day, God will meet those needs like he feeds the birds and clothes the flowers. 
we will have new challenges today. Every day is going to be a challenge. It would be awful boring if, if you, there wasn't challenges each day, wouldn't it? Some of you are saying, well, I think I might like a day of rest. <laughs> what will you face today? Not the same things you faced yesterday or what you will face tomorrow. Each day has its own trials and difficulties. Our Father knows that, so he gives us new and fresh mercies and compassions that are just what we need for each day. Every morning brings new temptations and sins. We can scarcely get our eyes open for some wrong thoughts or word comes along. So we constantly have need of new pardon every day. But God promises he will, with a temptation, make a way of escape in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God's new grace and mercy will mean where sin abounds, his grace will much more abound. Praise God. God has greater grace than your sin is. And God can pour that grace out upon any sin. Each new day brings new duties which you cannot perform in the natural. God may call you to lay hands on a sick person or to cast out a demon or lead a person to faith in Christ. That's why God said it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me every new day. How many of you have to get up and rely on that scripture? Because you know in your, in your own strength, you cannot make this next new day. That the enemy is strong and he's come at you with everything that he has. The word describes God's unmovable character. He is permanent and reliable. When the storms of life are blowing around us, we can know that God will be there in all of his power as solid as a rock. I really would like for you to get that embedded into your spirit, man, tonight. Because I know that that's where the enemy's working right now. To make us believe because the storm is so rough that God in some way or other has turned his back or isn't paying attention. The word describes God's unmovable character. He is permanent and reliable. When the storms of life are blowing around us, we can know that God will be there in all of his power as solid as a rock. He is the anchor that we can hold on to. No matter how high the waves crash or how hard the winds blow. See, you don't believe that or you wouldn't be walking in, in the path that you're walking in. You really have to believe that God's word is true in order to be secure in your walk with him. So I said he is the anchor that we can hold on to, and that's why we played that song tonight. No matter how high the waves crash or how hard the winds blow, isn't that what happened to the disciples in, in the boat the, the wind got boisterous and the waves got hard and strong and Jesus was asleep in the boat. How many of us can really just lay down and go to sleep when all hell has come against you? No, you got to sit up there and fight. Instead of giving it to God like Jesus did and went go to sleep, you think you have to stay up all night and pray through. And I, and I do know that sometimes we have to do that, but I think we do that too often. I think there's come a place in our walk with God where we have to be secure in him and know that if we've given it to him, that he's taking care of it. And he's fighting that battle and he just wants you to rest. He doesn't want you to get weary. He wants you to rest. All right, because so how many of you, when, when you're having a bad time, God just says, just go to bed, just lay down, forget about it. I have this thing. So you just have to lay everything aside and go into your bed and say, thank you, God, that you're taking care of this because I really am tired <laughs> and I need some rest. The battles aren't going to get any lighter. They're going to get stronger. And if you don't le learn right now to rest in God, you're not going to make it. And he's been telling us to get into peace and into rest, has he not? 
Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1 says, When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. If you don't believe that that glory can fall in your home like that, then you don't know your God. God's glory can come into your home where you can't move where people won't even become, be able to come into the room where you are sitting. There, there is a, I sat under a pastor whose mother did that. She always prayed at a certain time every morning in a certain spot. And one morning they went to come down to the kitchen. They couldn't enter the kitchen because the glory of God was in there so strong. Three days she sat there with a little cup of cold coffee, caught up in the glory of God. And nobody could enter the kitchen. Now, if that isn't God, I don't know what it is. And this is where God is trying to take his body to right now. Because we need to get so caught up in this if we're going to carry the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. You know, we just can no longer do life as usual. We can't. We have to yield every part of our being to God and we have to allow him to take us over no matter what is going on. Now, how many of you could honestly say that you're trying to stay in perfect peace <laughs> and God's bringing, I mean, and Satan's bringing perfect calamity in every, in every which way he can? So what do you have to, what's that do to you? It draws you closer to God it draws you closer to the fire and you hold tighter to his hand. Because if not, you know for a fact that it's going to take you out. This is where the body of Christ is at right now. We are, I'm hearing God say we are being tested for the final time. We are being tested for endurance in the storms that are coming. Are you failing the test? Or are you enduring the test only you and God know that the Bible speaks of God's mercy enduring forever countless times in uh, Psalms 106 one, you know the Bible talks about God's mercy and in Psalm 106 one says praise the Lord hallelujah oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever and I think that was part of a word that was sent out Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. In this psalm, Israel is reminded of their failures and God's mercy. What is mercy? Not receiving what we deserve. Some of us know we don't deserve to be loved at this place we're in right now. But God in his mercy comes down and loves us, places people in our lives who will love us and endure us <laughs> until God can turn us around. All right, so in this psalm, Israel is, is reminded of their failures in God's mercy. What is mercy? Not receiving what we deserve. When we fail, we deserve to be judged but instead of judging us, God restores us. Psalm 107 starts out, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Those who are redeemed should be saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 107 reveals in 
in four different ways how God showed mercy to the nation of Israel when they failed. In each case they failed, they repented, they cried out to God, and God in mercy delivered them. So when they failed, what did they do? In each case they failed, they repented first, cried out to God second, and God in mercy delivered them. So you have to take those two steps, and God in his mercy, he will deliver you out of the snare of the fowler. In verses 4 through 9, we have Israel's wandering in the wilderness before us. And we read in verses 4 and 5, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. When we read Exodus through Deuteronomy, we see that during their wandering, Israel murmured and complained about having no food or water. But eventually they saw the evil of their ways. And according to Psalm 107, verse 6, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distresses. What did they do? They cried out. That you're going to have to talk to God about what's going on in your life. That's just all there is to it. He already knows, but you need to talk to him about it. And then he delivered them out of their distresses. God's never-ending mercy was shown to those who deserved judgment. Every one of us in this room, everybody watching through the video, you know that you deserved God's judgment at different times in your life, but instead he showed you his mercy. Some of us know we should be dead right now, but God in his mercy, he reached down and he pulled us up. How the Maori claimed he would not let the enemy have us. In Psalm 107, verses 10 through 16, we see Israel enslaved. And verse 10 speaks of them being bound in affliction and irons. And it adds in verse 11, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. You want to get bound up? Just come against God and His word. Just come against God's servants, God's prophets. You'll get bound up. You'll get exactly what you're asking for. This section refers to, the, to their time during the Babylonian captivity as seen in the book of Daniel and in the history of the kings. But Psalm 107 verses 12 through 13 tells us God brought them to repentance Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried out the Lord in their trouble. In other words, God put them in a place they couldn't get out of. And it didn't, there wasn't any way to come and help them out of it. So then when they cried out to God, God came and helped them. Then they cried out the Lord in their trouble. What was the result? God's mercy was manifested again. It tells us in verses 13 through 14, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their chains in pieces. God's mercy endures forever. When all, I, when all else fails, call on God. <laughs> You know, as I was writing, studying these scriptures, I thought, well, God, from what you're saying here, when everything, they tried everything else, and when it didn't work, they called on you. And isn't that the way the church is today? We do everything in the world there is that we can do in our flesh, and then finally we call out to God, and he comes with his mercy, and he sets us free. Psalm 107, verses 17 through 20, may be referring prophetically to Israel's condition of being bodily afflicted when the Lord came to them at his first advent. Because Psalm 107, verse 17 declares, fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Who were afflicted? Fools. When the Lord appeared to them, multitudes came to him for healing. And verse 19 tells us, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he sent his word and healed them. They recognized it was their sins that brought them disease, so they repented and cried out to the one who could heal them. In mercy, he healed them, for his mercy endures forever. I'm telling you guys, all you have to do is cry out to God. And he'll come to your rescue with his mercy. And whatever it is that you need, he will supply it. You know, a healing of addiction or, or 
your monies or whatever. God is on the throne and he wants to heal you. We get the last picture in verses Psalms 107, 20 through 32, where sea men, your men on the sea, are caught in a terrible storm. And because of their sin of idolatry, we read in Psalm 107, 25 through 27, and the Bible says, For he commands and raises a stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths, their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their and they are at their wit's end. Scripture calls calls this the times of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah thirty verse seven. And in Daniel twelve one also referred to this. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as Never was such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at the time your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. We are at a time just like this. Troubles like we've never seen before. Instead of us fighting one another, we should be seeking God's face and God's help so he can deliver us from this time of great distress. All right, why are they delivered? And Psalm 107, 28 provides the answer. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and they bring and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so this waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. God is right now, God is trying to get America's attention. And what he and I know. A lot of people, a lot of churches, a lot of Christians are have been crying out to God before the election even. But he wants us to continue to press in. Don't say, oh, well, we, this is what it is. No, it's not. We don't see as God sees. He wants us to press in and keep pressing into him until he is able to do what he needs to do. And he needs our prayers and he's fasting. And he needs the honesty of our hearts. And he needs us to repent for not believing what he said. So he can go ahead and move and complete this journey that we're on. Conclusion. Are you getting the picture? Israel fails. They repent. And they cry out to the Lord. And he delivers them. For his mercy endures forever. In closing, we can take all of those examples from Psalm 107 and apply them to ourselves. For we, like Israel, often murmur and complain. We are in bondage to the world. We are physically afflicted because of some sin or we are found worshiping something or someone other than our God. But he faithfully deals with us when we fail, causing us to repent, to cry out to him. And then he delivers us. Why? Because his mercy endures forever. You need to understand sometimes when sickness is hitting your body, it's not because you sinned. It's because there's a whole lot of witchcraft going on because God told us about three years ago that witchcraft has begun again and is stronger than ever. And the witches are out there coming against us to try to stop us from sending the truth to the people. All right. God will provide for his children. Charles Spurgeon told this story of his grandfather, James, and his faith in God. Now, just listen to this. As you who are struggling, listen to what Charles Spurgeon's grandfather did. He had a large family and a very small income. But he loved his Lord, and he would not have given up his preaching of the gospel for anything. One day, the cow on which the family relied for milk for the children suddenly died. And James Spurgeon's wife was greatly concerned, but he said, God, God said he would provide, and I believe he could send us 50 cows if he pleased. On that same day, a group met in London, a group James Spurgeon did not know that wanted to help meet the needs of poor pastors. They raised a large sum of money and began sending it to different pastors in need to help their families. When they reached the end of the list, there were still five pounds left. That's like $50. 
One man suggested sending it to James Spurgeon. Another said, no, let's not send just five pounds. Let me add five more to go with it. Others joined in, and the day after his cow died, James Spurgeon received 20 pounds in the mail. Probably enough to buy a new cow. You can trust God to keep his promises and to provide for your needs. J uh, James Spurgeon's uncle wasn't. He stood on Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply, so supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Praise God that we don't deserve I'm sorry, praise God that we, we don't receive what we deserve. You know, we need to be a witness for God. And the other, the other day, my daughter was talking to me, and she said, I don't understand how you're keeping this house going, you know, since my husband passed. And I said, it's only by God's grace. And God promised me he would provide if I believed. So I believe. And God is keeping me. Now, I'm not becoming a millionaire or a hundred air, <laughs> but God is keeping me. And my family looks and say, I don't see how you're doing this because it is a miraculous thing that God is doing so I can keep a roof over everybody's head. I stand on this, my God shall supply all my needs because he told me that from day one according to his riches and glory. Are you listening here, guys? We can commit ourselves into the hands of our faithful creator. And you find that in 1 Peter 4.19. And know that he will always be faithful. God will fulfill all his promises to us. And Joshua said to the children of Israel in Joshua 23.14, You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled, not one has failed. And Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, because His mercy endures forever. This is what I'm hearing. Some of you have a blank page in your book of life. And that blank page is there because you don't believe that his mercy endures forever. Tonight, he wants to do a miracle in your life. And he wants you to be able to start trusting him, believing in him, knowing that his mercy does endure forever. And that God, if God has called you, then God will keep you. Some of you, God has called to do certain things and you're afraid to step out because you don't have the means to do it. Then you're not standing on the promises of God. Are you understanding this? When God told me to start this church, I had absolutely nothing. And God said, just take a step of faith and I'll be there with you. And everything God ever told me about this church has come to pass. And he's always been with me, always leading God and directing me. And when I slip and fall, he picks me back up again, brushes me off and tells me to get going again. I don't sin, but, you know, I grow weary. And I have to repent of growing weary. And he picks me up and says, go on. You have not completed your assignment. So how many of you in here tonight that you really don't under believe that God's mercies endures forever and that you have slipped and fallen and stayed down. You have not gotten back up to complete the assignment because you think the assignment's going to kill you. And it will. It'll kill every inch of flesh that you have. But you won't die physically. The altar's open for anointing to receive from God a blessing that will cause you to continue to go on and cause you to remember constantly that God's mercies are fresh every morning. And when you go to bed at night and ask God to forgive you, then you'll be assured that when you get up in the morning that you're forgiven. And it's a brand new day, brand new life, and all you have to do is walk in his promises. The anointing is really strong here tonight. If I was you, I'd come to the, come to the altar. If you really want that anointing 
to understand that God's mercies endure forever.